that. I said there's probably maybe three, four areas of kind of the factors. The first is the practitioner focus that you want. I knew that when I wanted to go to my master's program, I really wanted a really practitioner oriented program. I wanted a strong assistantship. I want strong, I want required practicums. I wanted all of that. And so I looked for a program for faculty members who had worked in student affairs because I wanted to work with student, with faculty members who had been practitioners. And just like any part of the academy, you have faculty members that may or may not have spent any um, significant time working actually in a student affairs unit, um, especially depending on the focus of the graduate program. And so I wanted faculty members who had worked in the field Welcome to Student Affairs Now, the online learning community for student affairs educators. I am the host of today's episode, Heather Shea. Today on the podcast, we're queuing up a two-part episode to kick off Careers in Student Affairs Month. We're discussing an important step in the process, selecting the right graduate program. Whether you're an undergrad student considering grad school or a professional looking to make a career change and go back to school, the decision of where to study can be overwhelming. On today's episode, my panelists will be offering guidance and expert advice to help you do your research as you begin to consider a career in student affairs. Before I bring in our guest today, let me tell you a little bit about our channel. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We hope you'll find these conversations make a contribution to the field and are restorative to the profession. Release new episodes every week on Wednesdays, and you can find us at studentaffairsnow.com, on YouTube, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Today's episode is sponsored by Simplicity, a true partner. Simplicity supports all aspects of student life with technology platforms that empower institutions to make data-driven decisions. Stay tuned to the end of the podcast for more information about our episode sponsor. As I mentioned, I'm the host for today's episode, Heather Shea. My pronouns are she, her, her, and hers, and I am broadcasting from the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Adawa, and Potawatomi peoples, otherwise known as East Lansing, Michigan, home of Michigan State University, where I work. Recently, I found myself engaging in conversations with undergraduate students who share a common aspiration, a career in student affairs. So for some, their next step might be working for a year or two and then going to grad school. But for many, myself included, embarking on grad school right after um, or right during senior year is the path that they're choosing. So as I said, today's episode is focused on this grad school search process. And I am thrilled to introduce uh, three panelists today. Uh, Dr. Lisa Landerman is the Vice President of Student Affairs at Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. Dr. Tiffany Davis is Associate Dean for Student Belonging and Success and Clinical Professor of Higher Education Leadership and Policy Studies at the University of Houston. And Will Shu is a Residence Director at the University of San Francisco. Thank you to all three of you for joining me today. Um, we're gonna start with just doing a quick introductions about your background and how you come into this conversation. And then if you can also share briefly where you went to grad school for your master's degree, why you chose that program, and what you wish you have would have done differently in the process. Um, so Lisa, I'm going to kick it off with you. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, I'm coming to you from Salem, Oregon, the land of the Kalapulia, who today are represented by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of the Sluts Indians. And to answer your question, my uh, graduate school, well, first of all, how I come to this conversation is I've been in student affairs for a, a long career and have worked with master's students at different institutions. I, I, I worked at Michigan State and, and we know a, a school that had a, had a strong graduate program and, and worked at others that, that didn't, but students who were seeking graduate school after their work in student affairs. I also taught in a, in a master's program uh, at the University of St. Thomas when I was in um, St. Paul. So I've been working with uh, master students for a long time and most recently uh, was the chair of NextGen in New Orleans. I, for myself, uh, chose Indiana University for my master's degree in higher ed and student affairs. And 
how I chose that was a lot of uh, talking to mentors, going, I went to the Oshkosh Placement Exchange to look for graduate assistantships, which is a placement conference that I think still exists today, we learned earlier. Um, but just a lot of talking where, asking my mentors where they went to school. And um, I was at the time a social work undergrad looking at uh, counseling or higher ed. And at the time, uh, Bloomington, uh, the, the higher program offered a dual degree in counseling and higher ed. And I thought that's what I wanted. What I wish I would have done differently uh, is I didn't really investigate the counseling program. <laughs> you know, that I, I only looked at the student affairs program and thought just checked off that I could get a dual counseling degree. It wasn't accredited. It was gonna require me to stay a third year, which is something I didn't wanna do. I would have had to take classes outside of order of my cohort. So I ended up within the first semester deciding I'm not doing that dual degree. And then I thought, had I not, you know, would I have still chosen IU? I don't know. I had a wonderful experience, but I, I think I would have done more homework about the degree that I was pursuing. I think maybe it says something about where my priority was though. Thanks, Lisa. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, Tiffany, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Dr. Tiffany Davis. My pronouns are she and hers. And I am currently broadcasting from the campus of University of Houston, where there is a strong history of numerous indigenous tribes and enslaved African Americans who have really shaped the land that I get to learn and work at. So how do I come to this conversation? So I was the traditional over-involved student leader um, on the campus of the University of Tennessee. And I was also a member of NASPA's NUF program. Um, and it's a program dedicated to introduce student affairs and really support the pipeline building for students from historically disenfranchised and marginalized populations. And so I had a mentor, I got to do a lot of exploration and I ended up at Bowling Green State University um, for my graduate degree in college student personnel. And so I am from the South. So I did not consider going to the Midwest for a degree, um, but I went to Bowling Green and I really chose that program for its practitioner focus. Um, everyone at the time and, and even still continuing in the program had the opportunity to have a uh, graduate assistantship and to gain some very good practical um, experience. And for me, I was very excited that I didn't have to do a area that I was already familiar with. And so that was really cool. So I went and I got an assistantship doing um, DEI work, essentially, and running a mentoring program. But then I also had a unique opp opportunity to also be a graduate house director. And so I lived in yeah. with 40 amazing women of Delta Zeta sorority. And that was also extending my um, my exposure to the field. And so that's why I chose um, Bowling Green State. It was a great decision. Um, I stick beside it. Um, I think when I think about what could I have done differently, for me, I don't actually have anything that I think I would do differently. I, I think the best decision that was so difference making was become being in community with other folks who were interested in the field of student affairs. So being in NUF, I had a mentor, I had mentoring conversations, I had went to professional conferences, I did an internship at um, an HBCU prior to going to grad school doing student affairs work. And so joining up with other folks who either through mentorships or through um, peers was probably so different speaking for me that that is, it, it allowed me a greater exposure to the field than I would have normally had. So that's me. Great. Thanks, Tiffany. And Will, welcome. Hi. Thank you so much for um, having me today. Uh, my name is Will Shu. My English pronouns are he and his. And I currently work uh, as a residence director at the University of San Francisco, um, uh, also known as the ancestral lands of the Ramaytush speaking Ohlone peoples. Um, and so in terms of uh, where I went to grad school, I uh, got my master's of science in student affairs administration at SUNY Binghamton University. Um, SUNY is uh, the state university of New York system. Um, and why I chose that program. So it was among eight graduate programs that I applied to at the time. Uh, it was not one of the programs that I was initially looking at. Uh, my mentor actually recommended it to me uh, because um, 
some uh, a faculty member um, that was um, who is really prominent in uh, particularly researching and um, writing scholarship about uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander students um, taught in that program and uh, knew that was going to be um, a good mentoring experience for me. Um, and in terms of uh, what I uh, wish I would have done differently in the process, um, so I actually wish I would have started earlier um, to apply to um, various mm -hmm. programs because um, I did feel a crunch um, when trying to get my applications done um, around the same time that I was in like my last uh, like set of midterms or even just like right before my final exams uh, since my undergrad was on the quarter system and I believe all the programs I was applying to they were on the semester system. Um, mm -hmm. so there was a little bit of a, um, a mismatched timeline there. Um, and um, also just to get more information about the program, uh, something that I was really looking forward to when I when my mentor first proposed the program to me and I did some research was that um, the program had the opportunity to either um, uh, pass a comprehensive exam um, or mm -hmm. to uh, write a master's thesis um, as like one of the culminating projects for um, your graduation requirement. Um, and uh, I didn't really know what that meant at the time, um, and but I liked uh, having the options. So, um, and it wasn't until like uh, being in the program um, that like I realized, oh, these options have very different, um, very different experiences. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I'll go ahead and pause there and probably expand a little bit more as we uh, continue in our time. That's great. Well, since we're talking a bit about our experiences, I'm just going to share a little bit about mine. I did go um, to my master's program at the same place that I did my undergrad, which was Colorado State University. Um, and if I had it to do over again, I would have tried and looked elsewhere, or at least explored mm -hmm. other options. I, mm -hmm. I applied to one program and I just went there because it was familiar, mm -hmm. I think. Ended up being a great experience, but mm -hmm. as I think a little bit about um, that process, I think I, I could have expanded my search a bit. So um, thank you all for sharing a little bit about how you come into the conversation and also about your backgrounds and programs. Um, before we get into kind of the search and applying and selecting, I want to focus just for a moment on a bigger question, which is how do I know student affairs is the right career for me? This could be an episode all in and of itself. Um, but Will, I, I, I know that you have thought about this and talked about it a little bit with NextGen. So I'd love to hear, how do you figure out what your why is? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, so um, just for a little bit of context, this is a conversation that we've integrated into ACPA's Next Generation Institute um, over, I believe, like the last one to two years. Um, and so really wanting the, um, the focus to be on our undergrad students or um, our students who are considering this field um, to do some soul searching of like, um, what, is, um, what is their reason for being and how does working in this field align with that? Um, there's this Japanese concept that we've um, like drawn from called Ikigai. And um, Ikigai is um, a basically translation, a reason for being. Um, and if you were to think about it in terms of a Venn diagram, um, your ikigai is at the center of what you're good at, what you love, what the world needs, and what you can be paid for. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, like many of us uh, came into this field because um, someone planted a seed when they saw that um, we were like particularly really involved student leaders um, or um, uh, or just like, um, yeah, uh, provided a lot of time and energy um, already from our positions as student leaders. Um, some of us uh, came into the field partially because uh, we wanted to be the professionals that we didn't have um, in our undergrad experience. Some of us came into the field because we wanted to be the professional that we did have in our undergrad experience. Um, and all of those things, they, they are valid and they have their own purpose in your meaning making experience but they're all external. So really like when I'm asking myself in the mirror, like what does Will want? Um, who does Will want to be? Um, like, I think that that answer, you know, 
doesn't have to be right off the bat, oh, I want to be a student affairs professional um, at a higher education institution, because let's be honest, most of us also didn't learn about this field until maybe our junior or senior <laughs> year. Um, <laughs> but it could be like, I know I want, I know that I want to make an impact on future generations of students. Um, mm -hmm. Does that necessarily mean college students? Doesn't have to. Does that necessarily have to be at a college campus? Doesn't have to either. But I know that my, like, that that purpose is um, what aligns me with my student mm -hmm. affairs career. Um, right. And um, and for me, it meets the things of like, what I'm good at, what I love, um, what the world needs and what I could be paid for. Um, so yeah, I'll start it off there. And, um, and yeah, for, for um, my colleagues here on this call, like, please feel free to chime in any of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, thanks, Willa. And I, I uh, worked with Will on NextGen and found that a really valuable way for us to think about engaging in a reflective process about what matters to us. And it doesn't mean that you know that you want to be a student affairs professional for your entire life, but what's the next step? And does you know, perhaps the values that you have and the priorities you have for your life align with the direction of a student affairs career if you're considering investing in a in a master's degree. So I, I found it really helpful in working with colleagues and, and students who are considering the field. I would also agree. And I think we, I am a previous chair of the NUF program, um, yes. of the NUF board. And we also do a whole session during the Dungy Leadership Institute. That's where all these photos are from different mm -hmm. years um, of the DLI. But one of the things that we did is start with why. And so we use, um, uh, the YouTube from Simon Sinek and based on his book, Start With Your Why. And I think that that's another space of like, understanding all of those pieces. So I would just like retweet, you know, repost um, the whole idea of thinking about starting with why. And that one thing that I would probably add is also like what types of context um, are also to you and being reflective about who you are because we gotta be real with who we are. Like mm -hmm. all of those things could be really good, but if you're not a person for a small town, then you're not going to be a person and you don't have to fit in that because what the field needs is we do need more folks who are willing to work in um, rural education and go to small town. You know, you we, we need people not to only want to work at urban, um, large research intensive institutions. We need folks and great folks to work at our community colleges. We need folks to go into working at for-profit institutions. And so sometimes we have to also kind of have folks hold up mirrors and windows of opportunities for us to be able to say, what is what are needs and where they are so like what types of context do you thrive in because sometimes we have narrow visions of what those contexts look like and where we can show up in them um, and then also places of like some of those things could all be true but for right now the priority is family all of those things about meeting needs da, 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 for some people it needs to come down to my family needs me in Houston, Texas. So I will go to whatever program is in Houston, Texas, or my partner needs me at this point, or I need to escape all of those folks. And I need, to <laughs> and you know, and so I think also like your current circumstance, context, things that are real for us also should be included as well as some of these existential, philosophical and um, values oriented um, questions. And together they really integrate to help someone to figure out their why and how they can move forward. Yeah, and I'd also say that we also know that um, you're gonna learn about the field mm -hmm. and all the options when you're in a master's program, you're not gonna know everything, but it is important to do a little bit of research and understand the field you're getting <laughs> into before you're gonna invest in a master's program, the time and financial commitment and emotional energy. And so understanding mm -hmm. that the institution that you love or the position, you know, the leadership position that you got in, it you may not find a job initially in that when you graduate or there are lots of other possibilities. And so if your focus is too narrow, 
um, you know, you might not be able to work at your alma mater <laughs> when you come mm -hmm. out or, or even mm -hmm. maybe even stay in your city, depending on what kind of, if it's only one institution in your city, because there might only be one person in that role that you're looking for. And so needing to consider that you might have to have some flexibility and again, know your parameters, yeah. know your, know your limits. Doesn't mean you have to move yeah. anywhere, but but you you might have to consider some flexibility in what you imagine that career in student affairs, at least initially, mm -hmm. would be. And it, it, it you might have seen your mentor have a position, but there are lots of positions in between before you can get probably what their role is. And so, yeah. doing a little research, talking to your mentors, talking to colleagues, and also regardless of the the role you're going to take, there are some skills that all professional need that maybe as a student you didn't see like yeah. learning how to work with students in distress or manage crisis uh some event planning that might not be what you wanted to do or why you went into student affairs but if you work on a college campus today you're all going to be touched with that kind of work and so recognizing the behind that behind the scenes work and then I'd also say commitment to working with diverse students, uh, all kinds of students, all generations, all cultural backgrounds, religious backgrounds, abilities, learning types, like you are going to be asked mm -hmm. to create community sense of belonging, provide service and educational opportunities for a diverse group of folks. And so being willing to think about doing your own learning and get experiences and work with a variety of populations and being committed to that most institutions across the country are, are going to ask that mm -hmm. of us and that's a value of our field so those are just some examples talking to mentors and other colleagues will help you discern is this is the field right for you enough to stick your toe in for that master's degree lisa i'm going to stick with you for a moment um because i do think that there's some interesting um presumptions we're making right like we are assuming mm -hmm. that a master's degree is an essential um, degree for entry into student affairs, but as a vice president, uh, what do you look for in people coming in and does the choice of a master's degree impact kind of what potential a person might have? So as people are thinking about selecting a program, how does somebody who's in your, in your type of role, think about, uh, master's degree selection sure. processes? It's a great question because I certainly know getting a master's degree it is a privilege, right? Like let's let's just name that. It costs time and, and money and, and energy, like we said before. And so it there are transferable skills. There are folks I've worked with some amazing professionals who did not have master's degrees in student affairs who were learned on the job and rose within the ranks. What I will say though is when I'm as a vice president, when I have the competition is steep, I am looking for some people who have some baseline understanding of students and student development and the current needs of students. And that often comes from students who've worked in the classroom and learned and studied and, and, and grappled with contemporary issues in student affairs. Mm -hmm. That experience I talked about of work, so it's not just book knowledge, but experiences working with diverse student populations and different kinds of institutional types. I love it mm -hmm. when I've worked with a student who's, you know, I, I had diverse experiences. I worked at this institution for my undergrad and this for my master's and I did this internship here because they're bringing a variety of experiences to make sense for who our, who our students are on our campus, not just, well, my last institution, we did it like this, that might not fit, but when you've had multiple experiences in different varieties, there's a way you're pulling the best from all those experiences. And usually a master's program is asking people to do field work and internships and have uh, you know assistantships that provide that. And I think in mm -hmm. a master's program, you also are, are gaining a professional identity. Um, that's part of that socialization into the field where you're exposed to you know, two professional associations, ACPA and NASPA, that you'll hear a lot if you're pursuing a degree, the American College Personnel Association and the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators. Uh, I'm sure we'll provide links. <laughs> um, that though they've created some competencies for the field. And most master's programs in student affairs or higher ed work are asking master's students to do to study those, to develop their own professional development plan, to do internship mm -hmm. or practicums that are showing where they have developed competency and thinking on those. And that's often what I'm looking for. Um, people who are committed to continuing their learning, like when you get your master's degree, your learning isn't done, but usually a master's degree 
sparks that pursuit of their passion. And even getting some both generalist experience, but maybe even an expertise passion that hopefully they're going to pursue at my institution, right? That they're going to say, great, you love, I'm going to look to you to lead us in leadership. You're not alone in doing that, but you might lead the way and you've gained the research skills and the networking Mm -hmm. skills and competencies in that, that will move my institution forward. So sometimes that master's degree is a proxy for some assumptions we make about getting those experiences. Certainly not every master's program is the same as we'll talk about. Certainly you can get many experiences and exposure that are transferable, but I know that that's what we say master's preferred. That's what I'm looking for and hoping for. Yeah. Yeah. Tiffany, um, as I think a little bit about the program, I mean, we're talking a lot mm-hmm. about experiences that we might have out of the classroom, mm-hmm. but I mean, at the end of the day, this is a degree that requires mm-hmm. um, courses and, yep. you know, so talk a little bit about how do people who are considering different programs um, consider the role of faculty and the faculty expertise and program reputation rankings, you know, just came out. Um, in terms of the decision making (laughs) process. So how did somebody um, assess these factors effectively as a faculty member yourself? Oh my gosh, yes. So this is year 11 um, for being a faculty member and over nine of those, I was a program director for either a master's program or a doctoral program, a PhD program. And I would say there are beer, there are differences, and that's mm-hmm. the first place to start. If you're looking for a master's program, typically I will tell students, I'm like, you want to have, you want to know who your faculty are going to be, who are going to be the folks that are going to be in the classroom with you. Um, and if a program has two different programs, so if it's a master's and they have a doctoral program, or they have certificates, or they have an undergraduate program, because there are some schools that have undergraduate degree programs in student affairs, you want to know, one, who are the faculty in the program? Two, how, what is their commitment to serving the master's programs? Because in some degree programs, there might be faculty members who only teach doctoral level courses, and there may be some that only teach master's level courses. And so, but when we put you, um, put a our pictures out to the world, it's like, here are all 10 faculty members, although you will probably may not meet three or four of them in any of your classes, right? But that doesn't mean that you might not be advised by them. Does not mean that you're not in a community with them in terms of your program and everything. So I think that faculty um, expertise, I wrote down a couple of things and I said, there's probably maybe four areas of kind of the factors. The first is the practitioner focus that you want. I knew that when I wanted to go to my master's program, I really wanted a really practitioner oriented program. I wanted a strong assistantship. I want strong, I want required practicums. I wanted all of that. And so I looked for a program for faculty members who had worked in student affairs because I wanted to work with student, with faculty members who had been practitioners. And just like any part of the academy, you have faculty members that may or may not have spent any Um, significant time working actually in a student affairs unit, um, especially depending on the focus of the graduate program. And so I wanted faculty members who had worked in the field. So my faculty members had worked in housing, they had worked in student life, they had worked, you know, they have done different things so that I knew that when they were bringing, um, they were coming into the classroom, they were going to be really focused on theory to practice. And that was really important to me. The same when I went and got my doctorate degree from the University of Georgia, I still looked for a practitioner oriented program, but because I knew that this was a PhD, I needed a a strong research methodological focus as well. So that's the first thing. Do you want a practitioner focus? Have the faculty members been practitioners before? The second is mentorship opportunities. And I say, looking at faculty, your faculty are going to oftentimes be we're kind of frontline folks to our students. And so I, um, for me, going to a master's program, I didn't choose a program where there were any Black faculty members. And so, and even when I went to my doctoral program, however, I am very intentional about that now of helping students if they want to see people who look like them phenotypically with any type of social identity, like, do you want your faculty members? So that's the question you have to sit with for yourself. What is the level of 
um, expectation or desire that you have for racial, gender, sexual identity concordance with your um, faculty members. For some people, because that doesn't automatically mean that there's going to be a connection and, 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 and relationship, but for some people, the availability of that is, is, is important. And so talking to faculty members about how they mentor students, what does it look like? What, how do they engage with students both inside and outside um, of a classroom? Does the program, um, do, are there faculty members involved in like their higher education student associations or anything like that? Like asking those types of questions because that's gonna get you to get a feel of how faculty. Um, the third thing is, um, thesis and research um, opportunities. I heard Will mention this um, about like looking at programs and do they have a comprehensive exam? Do they have a thesis option? Do they have a portfolio option? Like what's the culminating project? And so I remember when I was going, I just, I thought back, at, well, it's also been well over 20 years um, since I went to uh, my graduate program. And so I remember back then you, most programs had to do theses. And so I was like, ooh, I want thesis optional. And so at the time, Bowling Green was thesis optional, but I now have worked with and chaired students' dissertation um, theses, master's theses here at the University of Houston because we had students who, that was what drove them to our program and they had a faculty member who could help them and to be the chair of their theses project. So if you want a rich research environment, then you wanna be looking at that in the faculty and what are they working on? Do they involve their master's students? Do you want that research mentorship? And that's really tied to the next steps um, um, for where, and I know we talk a lot about planning and thinking, but it is really important. You don't have to know the exact destination, but I really embrace an idea around equifinality that there are multiple ways and routes to get to the same destination. But if you would kind of have an idea, if you do some of that pre-work of starting with why, where do you think you might want to go? Not a job title at a specific institution, but the realm, you can think about your next steps. So if you know that next steps might be faculty life, you might want to look at the faculty expertise in the thing that have around faculty development. Do they have a strong PhD program that they're training faculty? Like those might be some considerations around the faculty expertise in the present. And the same way with like, if you know that you want to eventually do like higher ed adjacent work and work at a think tank, you might want to connect with faculty member who that was what they did before they became mm -hmm. um, a faculty member or housing or um, there are certain institutions that become well known for certain things like because they may have the the Let's talk about like Rutgers, for example. Mm -hmm. Rutgers has the minority serving institution um, center there, right? And so if anyone has an interest in working with minority serving institutions, that's what Rutgers program might be a really good fit because you're going to be more, you're going to be closer to the action of a bunch of researchers and faculty members who are focused on that very idea. And so I think that that's some of the areas um, that I would look with faculty. Now let's talk about these ratings though. So with the rating, <laughs> there's right. kind of two areas, right? It's like, there is the US News and World Report. As now the student affairs academic lead who I, I do a lot of the institutional and institutional effectiveness reports to me, I now am the person that gets to fill out those reports. And so now I see all of the, the 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 reasons why not everyone will ascribe to accepting only U.S. News and World Report data because it does on some level um, like recreate and like buy into institutional kind of privilege and dominance and all these kind of things, right? So we know that all of those things kind of exist. If not, there are lots of articles you can read about it, but. There's also, but there's something to be said about these are programs that have traditionally, like my doctoral program, it was consistently rated in high, high um, um, ratings for being a top doctoral program, PhD program. I didn't consider that as much because my master's degree, there's also what's called street cred. Mm -hmm. There and in student affairs, like outside of the world, no one knows who Bowling Green State University is. You will meet a couple of people that will know about a Falcon. 
But if you talk to anyone in student affairs and they and you say, oh, I'm a BG alum, people are like, ooh, yep, okay. They know Bowling Green. Mm -hmm. They know Bowling Green. We're one of the oldest programs that has focused on student affairs, like strong scholars have come out of it, students, everything. And so we had street cred. We're not in the U.S. News and World Report. There are going to be some programs that have such that do such great things to support students that aren't going to be in U.S. News and World Report. So I always say it's like talk, go to info session, if info sessions, talk to people that have been in the programs, get those kind of first um, first insights from former students, former faculty, former staff members, all of those things to help you assess it in collaboration with looking at the faculty and asking questions um, and going to the info sessions. If faculty are there, they're gonna be able to answer questions as well. You gotta get a feel for it. There's not, there is no right program for anybody. There's just some best fit. Um, and I think that's something that we don't talk about enough in undergraduate. When you look at undergraduate admissions, they always talk about best fit philosophy. And I, and I try to attach that to graduate school. It's just a best fit. There's probably no perfect right place, but there are some places that will fit you better than others. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, so Will, you are, as a practitioner, um, tell me a little bit about aligning career aspirations with particular program strengths. And if you have any um, examples from your own experience of, of choosing your program or, or colleagues that you work with who, who really looked at um, a, a particular program and their strength, and then that was tied to where they wanted to um, take their career. Yeah. Um, so I think from, uh, I'm trying to think like, where do I start with this question? Um, so in terms of, um, how important is it for students to align their career, um, aspirations with like a program strengths? Um, I ultimately don't think it is, um, a necessity, but it can definitely be a pro. Um, and so, um, so like, let's break that down a little bit further. Um, every program, uh, generally has like, um, like a, a set of core, core, core course requirements. Um, and so those are going to be the things like your student development theory, your intro to student, um, to, um, student affairs administration, um, something usually something along the lines of like research methods of organization and administration um and so um those core requirements um sort of are um will give you a sense of what focus or like what um what are what are some of those strengths of that program mm -hmm. and then on top of that there's going to be elective requirements that you need to um, complete in order to meet the mm -hmm. um, requirements of your degree and the elective requirements are generally like more about your passion areas. Um, and so uh, at least I will say like in my grad programs experience, that is the frame of reference I'm going off of. Um, and um, so for my program, like um, my program was particularly strong in just like um, administration within the field. Um, mm -hmm. Nowadays, I think it's um, grown increasingly strong uh, with research and scholarship as well. Um, and um, I think that uh, even though like I um, I went to what I consider like a very generalist type program, um, it had some unique um, course opportunities that that has been sort of what I've leveraged um, in my field, mm -hmm. uh, in my in my professional trajectory. Um, so like one of the core uh, core courses for um, Binghamton's program was law in higher education. Um, that's not a super common one that I've heard in mm -hmm. uh, many programs. I hear it more as an elective as a, um, rather than mm -hmm. a core. Um, but, um, but particularly, um, even though uh, like right now, I think I'm, I'm in a place where I'm like considering, oh, do I wanna dig deeper into um, mm -hmm. law and higher education for like my, my continual learning? Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, something totally different, but um, where it has played out for me um, in serving my professional 
growth and how I've contributed to um, the institutions I've worked at um, is where I can take the lessons learned in that law class or even in my counseling methods class, which was an elective, um, and apply it to the uh, responsibilities of my position, such as like crisis management um, or and like particularly in crisis management when um, parents come calling and I got to explain FERPA um, or um, uh, or we need to talk about like um, institutional liability and like what is my role as the crisis responder um, in communicating with the appropriate um, colleagues at the institution to um, to uh, make sure that we are in full compliance um, legally as we support the student through um, like whatever the incident is. Um, and um, and also more recently, it has also shown up in how I serve as a referral agent and um, mm -hmm. an ally, a referral agent to specifically our student disability services office um, with SDS and the American um, Americans with Disabilities Act, um, mm -hmm. ADA for short, uh, and how I um, how I work with our, my colleagues in SDS to. Um, fulfill accommodations for our students mm -hmm. as well, um, particularly those uh, students who live in our residence halls. So, um, so nothing, I, I, I wouldn't say like success stories in terms of nothing like grandiose, but, um, but I do think that having some of this um, schooling, uh, what mm -hmm. helps me not only just um, do something because the institution tells me to do it, but I know why I have to do it. Um, and uh, I think that why is also what helps to also break down the barriers for some of our students who like um, sometimes get passed around from resource to resource to resource and they don't always know the why or like, um, or even parents, um, like when I'm supporting um, particularly those of like uh, where higher education is, um, I'm sorry, uh, where like the mm -hmm. students and the families that I'm supporting are particularly um, first generation college students. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think uh, those are um, the, the main things that I have in my notes here, uh, mm -hmm. where uh, I think that ultimately, um, whatever program you choose and, um, and uh, you can determine how much you want it to align with your career aspirations. But if you just decide to go with something more general and you want to just explore, um, then that is also an option. And um, and what you graduate with doesn't determine like where you go or where you end up, um, because you always have the ability to engage in like career development in our field to leverage mm -hmm. your experiences and your schooling um, to like to where you want to take it. Mm -hmm. Great. Can I, can I add one thing there too? I sure. think that there is another part of that, that for some folks, it may be exactly what you want to do because let's say, and I don't know all the schools right now either. So, but I'm just going to give an example. Like if you know, you want to be an academic advisor, you can go pretty much to any institution, um, as we said, there's transferable skills, but we also know that Kansas State does a really good job with because they have a whole academic advising graduate certificate. And so there may be some very niche spaces that offer you the opportunity for your career and um, your career aspirations. So like if you want to do academic advising or if you wanted to do um, sports administration, there's some places that offer certificates in that, or if you know you want to do research methodology, there's some places that do that, mm -hmm. or IE work, or if you know that your career aspirations are you want to work in fraternity and sorority life, you may choose an institution that their program strength might be that they have multiple uh, multiple graduate assistantships in fraternity and sorority life, because most places only have one, and they are yeah. hot tickets. Mm -hmm. And so that might be the thing that is, so sometimes you do want to look at those program strengths for your career aspirations, especially this goes into a broader conversation that I'm sure, um, Heather, you're like, that's a whole nother uh, webinar about <laughs> what does it mean to be a generalist versus a Oh my uh, gosh, we have to talk about that. <laughs> and, yeah. and being a generalist, because I think to Will's point is like, 
is exactly how I approached it because I wanted to be a generalist. But for those students who want to be specialists, some people are making decisions. I'm not going to that institution because I have a, can't have a fraternity and sorority life GA ship. And I've heard that if I don't have a GA ship in fraternity and sorority life, it's hard for me to break into the field. Or if I don't have a, you know, so I think that again, looking at what your unique context and situation is can be really helpful to determine if you need to be more niche and look at program strengths in that way versus not. Yeah, maybe this goes without saying, the only other thing I would add to this very rich you know, mm-hmm. examples is, I think it matters, the, the, I think what we're saying is your practical experience matters. It can't, mm-hmm. you know, if you don't, mm-hmm. are coming from having work experience in higher ed or student affairs or either coming straight from your undergrad or transferring mm-hmm. without experience to, to make it in a career in student affairs, it'll be much easier and, and you'll mm-hmm. be have a leg up if you have a car picking mm-hmm. a, a program where having a rich practicums, field work, internship assistantships yeah. are options. And I think those options are made that much easier if there's a connection between the division of student affairs and the program. I was shocked a little bit of how there there are institutions where there isn't a lot of collaboration, like that you apply for a program and then on your own, you're going to apply mm-hmm. for assistantships yeah. and the two mm-hmm. don't talk, right? Or or they just are, because they're maybe pulling not just from student affairs, but some big programs, they're pulling from counseling and social work and student affairs. And so it's, you know, you're competing you know, writ large with other programs. Sometimes it's, look, we're not going to let you in unless you have an assistantship. Assistantship, As scary as that sounds, actually, Mm -hmm. I don't want to go to a master's program if I don't have an assistantship because Mm -hmm. I will just have a credential without experience for where I was with Mm -hmm. limited experience. So actually didn't scare, right. And that didn't scare me. I knew that was a benefit, right. And Mm -hmm. so they worked really closely to try to find, or sometimes even create opportunities when they're like, wow, well, you know, you're interested in that. Let me connect you with someone, someone else, right. I, I know colleagues at Indiana where that happened so i i think understanding that and where where a program can help streamline that the day that you're in, you know you might have to interview for an assistantship and they also have opportunities for you to meet the faculty i know a lot of that is done virtually now um but if you mm-hmm. I, I would say if you can visit that would be a great idea but if, if you mm-hmm. can't even it's virtually that they're helping make those connections or coordinating mm-hmm. timelines for assistantships i think that says something First of all, it makes your, your your selection easier, but it says something, I think, about the kind of experience you're going to get on that campus in the second semester or in year two. Sometimes people want to change assistantships, you know, that you, you right. think you're going in and going to be in fraternity and sorority life and you realize a, a new passion. Mm-hmm. So your second year, you want a different assistantship. Uh-huh. You know, is that frowned upon? Mm-hmm. Is that happened? <laughs> so those are the yeah. kinds of I think assumptions we would make that those are connected. And I think that's a little insider uh, just tip that you might want to check that out and mm-hmm. think to your advantage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This has been such a phenomenal conversation today. I'm so grateful uh, for everyone's contributions. And I want to ask one more question before we get to final thoughts, because I do think we are in a, in a current, um, like maybe a tipping point in terms of what is in the uh, landscape, what's on the horizon. Um, And as you think about like emerging trends facing higher education, but specifically facing our field, you know, Mm -hmm. how important is it that we consider that in our graduate school selection process? And I guess the other piece to that, and Lisa, you kind of spoke to this, actually all of you have spoken to this, like are there specific skills and knowledge that are becoming increasingly valuable in the field as we are interacting with, um, you know, students with different types of backgrounds and experiences mm-hmm. or, or students who have, um, you know, whether it's, it's, they have, are coming from different socioeconomic backgrounds and, you know, we have an increasing, um, homeless student population, um, on our campus, you know, what is, what are those kinds of skills and knowledge experiences that are becoming increasingly valuable? Um, so Lisa, I'll, I'll have you kind of kick us off on this. We'll talk about this and then we'll go to final thoughts. <laughs> yeah, you know, I might even start with skills that are about kind of our own self-management skills. Mm. I mean, it's it's tough work. So you're, you're naming things like homelessness and, you know, sexual violence and racial tensions. Like those, that's deep, heavy, heavy work. 
And so I think more and more um, where people have done their own work on um, their own well-being, uh, their own uh, able to have networks outside of work, um, how to balance stress, how to manage, you know, it's a whole other conversation about what is, does work-life balance exist in student affairs, but where you get to, you know, manage your priorities. So that's administrative skills. That's also just emotional intelligence work. So all of those are skills, right? That self-management work that I think we think you'll develop that mm. over time as an adult. Certainly we all do, right? <laughs> as Marsha Bexman Golden would tell us in self-authorship, we, we <laughs> evolve right later in our late yeah. 20s. But but I would say more and more, you will be more successful if you are honing those, prioritizing your self-care and your self-management and those strategies so that you can have the attention and the energy and the well-being to do that. We're going to take care of yourself before you can kind of give to others. And that's you know, that's a that's a skill. And certainly where we are knowledgeable and current on higher education issues. So you named like, mm -hmm. you know, food insecurity and yeah. um, houselessness. I mean, that some of that is regionally dependent, you know, and, and environmentally dependent. But when you're thinking about where you want to work, knowing what the current issues and town gown relationship tensions, um, staying abreast and having curiosity about the community that you're a part of. I think that's something we mm -hmm. don't talk enough about and where your students might be coming right. from. If they're commuting students or, or regionally, I'm learning a lot about living in Oregon. I've never lived in Oregon these last three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, and I'd say, so when I lived on the East Coast, there's a lot of things that, you know, they don't tell you that necessarily in graduate school, but you are a mm -hmm. member of a, not just an institutional community, but, mm -hmm. There is a subtle expectation of being a contributing member to your mm -hmm. larger community, particularly as you rise in the field. Um, you are representative of the institution. And uh, and I think that those are kind of skills, um, uh, sort of ways of being, ways of knowing that I think are worth considering and, and developing. How do I get engaged, civically engaged in my community? Those kinds of things. Mm. In addition uh, to, I think I named crisis intervention, crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I named, I named yeah. those and this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Willard, think, Tiffany, what would you share? Uh, yeah, I think uh, from where I chime in is um, like when I think back to my grad, uh, to my grad program, there were things that were emerging at that time that um, like many of us had just recently experienced in undergrad. So we were able to like bring those questions and um, try to draw those connections um, in our like um, class sessions uh, or in our um, in our uh, assistantship and internship experiences um, where I um, in terms of like emerges emerging uh, factoring in emerging emerging trends and challenges um, when selecting a program um, I I feel like um, if that is a particular passion area for you, then you can always um, look at like what are the, some of the um, special specializations of the different faculty members who like um, mm -hmm. are leading some of those courses. Um, but in terms of like uh, specific skills or knowledge areas that are becoming increasingly valuable in these fields, um, in my mind, I feel like um, digital uh, how we engage uh, college students in like digital spaces. Mm -hmm coming increasingly valuable um, and particularly how we leverage technology. Um, and also um, like uh, how we are as a society are also reckon um, reckoning with the ways that accessibility um, continues to um, like develop and evolve um, for how we um, support all of our college students um, so that they have like what they need in order to be successful. Um, so um, those are some of the things that come to my mind. Um, Dr. Tiffany, anything for you? Um, I think for mine, um, as a new master's student, I really just look for students who are teachable and are open to exploring the field because most people come to the field with a very specific 
uh, engagement pattern, a very specific reason, region, um, reason for wanting to be in our field, but our field is so expansive. Um, and so I really like to hear that incoming master students are like, this is what prompted my interest, but here's all the things I'm excited to learn about. I'm excited to learn about all of these different classes. I'm excited to do an internship. I don't know where, I may pick something up. Like I think that remaining teachable and remaining open to the expansive options is a really good because so often now we have this thing where so many people feel like they have to be so prepared. And I'm like, do what you need to do in your undergraduate education classes that you're keeping your GPA up, you're doing, you know, but that's not everyone's story. Some students come into student affairs, but they had to work. So that's their only involvement when they were in college. And they want to be that for somebody else, but they were a working student. So they're not going to have a long list of accolades, achievements, and stuff like that. But they were a working student who committed to their family and to themselves to make it through college. And so I, I, I always like to level set of like, we're not looking for a super star and rock star, we're looking for someone who wants to engage this experience. And so that's generally what the trend is. And I would say a challenge very quickly is that I work in Texas and there are several states where people are like, mm, I don't want to live or work there. Um, and so I think it is important to also still because there's still good work and we need great people to be in this state to be able to yes. serve as the activist, the, you know, the lobbyist, the, you know, to help and support because while we have a lot of issues. Um, we still have students that represent those identities that need support and safety and space, um, people holding space for them. And so there's a need for us to be in these spaces and also to be well, right? And so I think there's a lot of opportunities. So there are ways to change challenge into opportunities for people that are up for that and um, that uh, use the community and not just your program as an opportunity for you to find community and kinship um, as well. Thank you so much for that, because I, I think that's a really important kind of um, point to to emphasize, right? That, you know, where you go doesn't necessarily mean where you'll end up. And we have folks all over the country, um, institutions mm -hmm. of higher education all over the country. Uh, thank you all so much for the great conversation today. Um, as you know, our podcast is called Student Affairs Now. We always kind of end with a quick summary of what you're pondering, questioning, excited about, or troubled by now. Um, and so, uh, Tiffany, we're going to stick with you. What, what are your final thoughts? My final thoughts is that I'm just really excited to see a new, newer generations of, um, mm -hmm. student affairs leaders. And it, you know, I'm now in an associate dean role, so I'm not as close to, I've been missing my, my programs for the last year. And I am just so excited because I'm back into the everyday frontline work, working with mm -hmm. students. And I'm just very excited for the next generation. And so I just hope that everyone's listening and watching um, is just open to reaching out to different folks, find out more, expand, find your community, um, because I believe that this is a great career um, that offers a lot of different vantage points and different directions um, within the role. So I'm just very excited about it. Great. Thank you, Tiffany. Will? Uh, I think I'm particularly excited about um, seeing uh, these future generations of student affairs master students. And, um, and I really hope, um, I am excited to hear um, like what their uh, reason for being is and how it connects to their purpose mm -hmm. in this field. Um, so I think that that will be a very fun icebreaker question on the first day of grad school. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And Lisa. You know, I, I'm getting really excited about really emphasizing our role as student affairs educators. And that's mm -hmm. trickling down into even the students we're working with. We've talked about crisis. We've talked about, you know, event planning, community building, and all those things are important, but we contribute to the educational lives of students. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we're not seen as that. And I'm excited about, we're, we're, we're doing lots of transformative work on, and many campuses are on a curricular approach to our work as a division of student affairs that is thinking mm -hmm. about what are our learning outcomes that are consistent with our institutional mission, our divisional mission? How are we how are we having those in mind and then developing strategies that meet those needs? And it means we have to maybe let go of some things and do some things differently and creatively 
and using our master's degree and our educational background and experience to create uh, new educational opportunities. And I'm watching our division get really energized by that possibility and connecting nationally on those. And so I think it's an exciting time as I'm watching colleagues across the country revitalize that educational mission of our of our work. And I think it's an exciting time uh, in student affairs as that's kind of catching on. Yeah. And as folks are considering careers in student affairs, I hope this episode has kind of sparked your interest in, we're going to drop a whole bunch of links into our show notes today. Um, thank you for all of your time today. We do have a part two to this conversation, which will focus on some of the really specific logistics about grad school applications and, and that kind of thing, which we will be offering shortly. Um, so thank you, all three of you, for your contributions today and also sending heartfelt appreciation to the dedicated behind the scenes work of our producer, Nat Ambrosi. Thank you, Nat, for making us look and sound great. And thanks also to the sponsor of today's episode. Simplicity is a global leader in student services technology platforms with state of the art technology that empowers institutions to make data driven decisions specific to their goals. A true partner to the institution, Simplicity supports all aspects of student life, including but not limited to career services and development, student conduct and well-being, student success, and accessibility services. So to learn more, you can visit simplicity.com or connect with them on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Please take a moment to visit our website and click on sponsors to learn more. And if you are a new professional or a thinking about grad school person, if you go to our website, um, you can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter, which will help keep you apprised of that other episode, as well as look at our archives, which kind of run the gamut of all the different aspects <laughs> of the field. Um, Thanks again to everybody. Um, I'm Heather Shea. Thanks for our listeners and everybody who's watching. Have a great week, everyone.